Have you ever sat and stared up at the stars and wondered, where did we come from? Let's take a journey like no other, not to a place, but to a time. Join us as we delve deep into the human past and explore our shared human origins. Welcome to the world of paleoanthropology. Hello, everybody. This is Seth with the world of paleoanthropology, and you know that this means it's another episode of The Story of Us. This time we have Professor Dr. Todd Disato with us, and I'll hand it over for him to talk a little bit about himself. Okay. Well, given your title and topic, I actually started out as a, uh, I was very interested in um, when I went off to grad school, I wanted to study anatomy, paleoanthropology, and I was particularly interested in Miocene hominoids. Mm -hmm. And so I went to Harvard to study with David Pilbeam. I did two field seasons in the Shawalik Hills of Pakistan. Um, I even found two Shiva Pithecus. I found the first complete, nearly complete humerus of Shiva Pithecus and uh, a molar um, but as grad school or college in general should do by serendipity i got sidetracked into molecular genetics <laughs> so i went from you know taking anatomy at harvard med school uh Neil Shubin, your inner fish, was actually my mm. cadaver partner. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, so we're still buddies to this day because you can't dissect a uh, without becoming friends with the people doing it with you. <laughs> but um, as I said, I got sidetracked into molecular genetics. But at the time, my interests were the same, trying to reconstruct evolutionary history basically so i switched from sort of paleoanthropology trying to come up with phylogenetic hypotheses to molecular genetics coming up with phylogenetic hypotheses um and so that's when i finished at harvard i was one of those unicorns in this day and age um new york university hired me before I finished my PhD, mm, okay. in fact, I gave my job talk the Monday before Thanksgiving, and before Christmas, I had the job offer. I did not write a word of my thesis until February, the following February. So they not only hired me without a degree, I didn't have a word <laughs> of my <laughs> thesis written, which was, you know, good break for me <laughs> and uh i wrote my thesis i defended it on friday march 13th because they offered me thursday or friday i was like well i'll do friday the 13th <laughs> i mean you know why not yeah and uh i defended it passed it made the corrections and handed it in and then my wife and I's first son was born on April 2nd. So wow. I had a pretty so hard, time. hard deadline. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, it sounds then we literally, both of us, she finished her medical residency. I got my PhD in June. And on July 1st, we moved to New York City to start our new jobs. Both of us, her at... Uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine and me at NYU. So we we crammed, you know, four or five years of life into about four months. <laughs> <laughs> but it's I I can't recommend that highly enough. Mm -hmm. They're the worst four months of your life, but then they're done. You just cleared That's five true. years of your schedule. <laughs> now we'll get to this in a bit. You were at you have just left NYU, but you were there for a while. So why 27 us, years. <laughs> so why don't you tell us a little bit about what you did while you were there? So while I was at NYU, I followed up on what I was interested in for my PhD, and that was molecular phylogeny of the primates. And I basically spent my entire 
entire time at NYU working on figure, well, I, you should never say figured out or we solved it, but inferring primate phylogeny, you know, the strongest hypothesis we have for who's related to whom. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I don't want to sound arrogant, but we kind of did that over those 27 <laughs> years. We, we have now there's some twigs and some leaves and some tiny branches left. And we still occasionally find new primates. Um, right. You know, Rungwasibus capungi, uh, Cercopithecus salatus, uh, Lumamiensis, uh, Gorilla gorilla dielli um all mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. my my research groups have been involved in i won't say discovering because everybody knew about them that lived there <laughs> but <Right. in> defining <laughs> them sort of scientifically like seven or eight new taxa of primates wow. eight strepsirines and circopithecines old world monkeys mm-hmm. um so again, we did not discover them. We just helped define them, um, which, <coughs> excuse me, led to this other side light. I'm sure will come up in this discussion <laughs> about looking for new primates. <laughs> but um, so I spent most of my time working on either inferring the primate evolutionary tree or dealing very specifically with certain groups like baboons on their evolutionary history and the fact that they hybridize wherever they meet, et cetera, et cetera, which basically now we know that uh, ancestral humans, wherever they met, (laughs) hybridized. And yet I have like five papers saying Neanderthals and humans never intermixed. But that was pre-2011. <laughs> right. I was about to ask when those <laughs> when those the, came the, out. Yeah. the data up to the time mm-hmm. suggested that there was no introgression whatsoever. Never say never. <laughs> um, new technology, new data is continuously. I mean. We're getting Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA out of 40,000-year-old cave dirt now. (laughs) Right, right. It's amazing. And that is basically what I'm switching to with my new career at Mm. UMass, is I'm very interested in environmental DNA. So environmental sampling for biodiversity surveys. We can go back in time for climate change info um and i want to know if mountain lions are literally in my backyard here i got (laughs) acres of woods behind me literally right outside the window and there's claims of mountain lions but until like with my bigfoot bounty show unless you got dna i ain't gonna believe it (laughs) right right so that is I mean, obviously, clearly, there is a line of interest there in genetics. And I think that is possibly one of, I always say anthropology and paleoanthropology is one of the fastest moving sciences. I feel like genetics is even faster. There's new discoveries, it seems, all the time with new technology. And as someone who uses all of these high tech machines, I just have a curious question. Which one do you think is the most consequential? Which of these machines that you use gives us the most data? Well, so we had a big debate in my lab because we've done a bunch of this research about next generation DNA sequence technology. Mm -hmm. Problem Mm -hmm. is there's always a next. Right. So we try to refer to this next generation stuff as second generation. So Mm. I was in, well, maybe third. I was in the zero generation when we did this manually. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But I was also had one of the very first automated DNA sequencers for Sanger sequencing. But, you know, it could sequence 600 bases 
of a very particular fragment of DNA over a day right. um, for a lot of money. Right. So right. My, my favorite uh, slides, I don't have them in front of me. I'll be using them in two weeks and don't quote me directly because I might get off by a factor of 10, which is astounding in itself. But in the year 2000, when they finished the human genome, version right. 1.0, yeah. I don't know, mm -hmm. we're at 29.5 or something. <laughs> um, it cost $10,000 to sequence a million bases of DNA. Today, I can sequence a million bases of DNA for a tenth of a cent. And for people watching, how many bases of DNA are in the human genome? So the human, human genome is about 3 billion, and we are very close to under $1,000 a genome. And so huge improvements. Yeah, but if you think of it, the amount of data in the human genome for your health status alone, I've had four mm -hmm. genetic tests in the last nine months to see if various issues I've had were deep or superficial. Um, right. An MRI, you go get your knee done. If you're not insured, that's 800, 900,000 bucks. <laughs> you can get your genome sequenced for less than that. <laughs> and it tells <laughs> a lot. <laughs> right, right. Uh, what what are some things that we can learn from the genome? Well, so obviously ancestry is what most people are interested. In. You know, everybody's well, not everybody, but nerds like me have done twenty three and me <laughs> for the whole family. Uh, I can, I've been able to confirm for twenty five years that both of my sons are mine but 23 <laughs> and me really demonstrates that they are <laughs> so we actually at nyu we use mine and my wife of 35 years dna and both of our boys dna to train our lab interns into mm. paternity analyses okay here's how you actually do a paternity analysis and we my wife swore they were mine so the first year we're like okay let's see how this goes but <laughs> it worked <laughs> <laughs> well that's good to hear yeah um so you know going back to more primatology and anthropology you were talking about your work with this not discovering apes or primates, as you said, of course, but describing them. And I, when you mentioned this, I wanted to take a pause and just enlighten everyone how important that is, having something described. So the most important thing besides just the science geek thing, like, hey, you know, we found something new and we described it. I don't have anything named after me yet. I'm hoping one of my students someday does before I die. But, you know, if they don't, oh, well. But the conservation and legal issues are huge. Mm -hmm. You can't just say, oh, this group of monkeys are important. Let's not let people kill them. Let's save their habitat. Under the International Convention for the Trade in Endangered Species, the Endangered Species, internationally, the Endangered Species Act in the US, things need to be named. They need to be defined. And if they're not defined, ah, that's just those weird looking squirrels outside my window. Who cares? Right. But if I give them a formal taxonomic description this is this species then all of those national and international laws can then be applied to them so it's actually it, it's kind of important how you name things because otherwise 
they're like, well, there's 20 other populations of those guys nearby. Who cares if we build a dam here and kill these ones? Right. So, Which is, of course, devastating conserver conservationally, as right. you mentioned. If we Which don't. is one of the reasons I'm kind of moving my focus away from what I've done. Mm -hmm. Because, again, without sounding like an asshole, we've done it. <laughs> right. To using it. <laughs> Let's now screen for biodiversity. Instead of sending some poor grad student off into the field for like 14 months to see what's present there, how about I send them there for a week and get 20 soil samples, and then I'll tell you what's present there. <laughs> Especially the things that are at night that you can't see. <laughs> right. Definitely, that would be, you know, extremely useful to have that information, which is probably lacking, I would assume. Now, rehashing a discussion you might recall, I've had Professor uh, Jeremy De Silva on the show a few times. Mm -hmm. and he's helped me out with a few things. And he, in his book, First Steps, had a discussion with you about when the first bipedal hominins or when hominins I don't recall exactly when hominins split probably from other primates was probably the question and I want my viewers to understand the whole concept of how far back this is and how you know and how it's counted if you can Right. squeeze that in so to, it's yeah. it's kind well i don't think it's controversial but there has been a controversy in the last decade but excuse me if you go all the way back to the latest 70s um you know vince sarich and those guys mm -hmm. they proposed that humans and chimps split six million years ago we're more closely related to chimps than gorillas are to chimps and the orangutans are distant relatives. You know, the pongids, that's that's our old school view. About 10 years, so that lasted for a good 10, 15 years, a six, six and a half million year split date, which I'm still a strong proponent of. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> some people came up with some new dating techniques that they're trying to push that back to nine or 10 million years. And I completely disagree with them mm -hmm. on, for two reasons. One, absurdly, as a molecular geneticist who has destroyed many paleontological fantasies, <laughs> uh, the fossil record is not compatible with humans and chimps spit, splitting nine or 10 million years ago, unless right. we are literally missing 50% of the fossil record. And I don't think so. <laughs> Given how many hominins we've discovered in the, since 2000, it's absurd. Mm -hmm. So you right. earlier at the beginning, you said, oh, genetics has advanced so much. Mm -hmm. We've quintupled the human fossil record or the hominin right. fossil record since the year 2000. Right. It's been insane. And so I cannot envision or imagine a eight or nine million year split between humans and chimps mm -hmm. when we got a half a dozen hominins younger than. Right. That. So but the second half of the controversy was and again, this is weird for me because people think I'm an anti-paleo person. I started out paleoanthro. I use paleoanthro every day. We calibrate mm -hmm. our molecular clocks with paleoanthro. The right. geneticist, and I, I, I don't even want to use the word hubris, but um, the <laughs> geneticist like, well, we got all these mother, father, infant triad. So we can estimate the mutation rate and then we can guesstimate back in time using that rate, splits and stuff. But things change and shift over time. So today's modern human mutation rate, mom, dad, kid, 
who knows what it was with Homo erectus right. or Australopithecus afarensis or earlier. Um, and so I think that's a very misleading thing. And it's missing a really key component. The change in DNA sequences over time has two components. The okay. absolute mutation rate, like this happens once every 6,000 years, but the fixation rate, is that mutation saved? If that mutation happened and we never saw it, it doesn't exist to us. Right. Yeah. It's the tree falling in the forest that nobody saw. <laughs> um, and so I think the slight, well, I wouldn't even say slightly, they're pushing nine, 10 million year human chimp split. And I just don't see the fossil record supporting that. I don't see the sort of logic behind interpolating from mom, dad, and kid to evolutionary time. But the thing, and I've written several papers on this, if you push human chimp back to, let's just say for round number 10 million, that pushes uh, old world monkeys and apes back to 40. Right. It's That's not possible with everything we know about the fossil record. And so I'm still, uh, you know, five and a half to six and a half million year human chimp split, which if you look at Auroran, Tugenensis, mm -hmm. Artipithecus, and Sahil Anthropus, they're really ambivalent. Right. If they had already been hominins for three million or four million years, they wouldn't be ambivalent. I mean, exactly. So I'm, you know, as confident as a guy who once said Neanderthals and humans never interbred <laughs> <laughs> that humans and chimps split six and a half million years ago. But that's what science and that's what our field is. Exactly. And one thing that I've been encountering on my some of my social media pages the last few days that I just like to highlight right now is science changes. It it evolves just like evolution. It it changes. And people who say, oh well, this idea was wrong then, so screw science, that's that's not how it works. Yeah. Piltdown um, was wrong. That has no effect on us today. Uh yeah. What's the Nebraska man, his, the, the pig tooth? You know, that was wrong. <laughs> his right. pig yeah. is something I can't remember. But um, <laughs> I, yeah, there, there are but, tons of wrong. And those were like wildly misinterpreted or outright fraud. Mm -hmm. The more mm -hmm. important thing in this literally day and age mm -hmm. is... Is it aerosolized <laughs> or not? You know, how does right. it spread? Um, you know, we're dealing with this. Oh my God, we're going through this. Well, so I'm in two weeks, I'm starting my emerging disease course. Okay. And not only am I going to be dealing with COVID, right? Now, we monkey monkey pox pox and with polio, polio in, in the background. Mm hmm. Yeah. And the next spillover event, the next Zunos. Yeah, There's a thousand out there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, I'm kind of a Debbie Downer, but I'm also a prepper. Not a not mm -hmm. like an insane prepper, but right. I, I I'm I can lock down either of my houses for ten weeks, and <laughs> we got no problems. <laughs> well, I you know I think there's a very healthy level of that and with what we've seen recently i'm not putting anything past what's healthy at the moment so. yeah no <laughs> um, yeah um being prepared is definitely something i need a little slice of these days if not all the time but 
Mm-hmm. So when we talk about finding new primates, there's been a question that I have been asked multiple times that I have been a little confused on. So there's a supposed ghost population, of course, that everyone talks about. What can you tell us about this ghost population? Are is you talking? Is there proof of it? Or hum, what, which I'm not sure. Which I so not only on my feed do I got the real scientists, I got the Bigfooters, I got the alien people, and I got the ghost hunters. So which ghost population <laughs> are you talking about? Uh, supposedly. So we have uh, what is it? There's Neanderthals, Denisovans, late Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, even Homo naledi. But then there's someone else at this time that is... So there are several populations in the last 50,000 years that have hybridized with modern humans. Mm-hmm. So the best guess right now, it's two to three archaic populations in Africa. Okay. For which we do not have a fossil nor an ancient genome. But we have the signature of introgression. The same okay. thing in India, South Asia. I mean, there's there's four or five signatures that look just like Neanderthal or Denisovan mm-hmm. signatures in different populations throughout the world. So ghost lineage, it's eh, it's a sucky term, but it's what we're kind mm-hmm. of stuck with. I mean, the coelacanth until 1920 or 30 was a ghost. Right. And then they caught him. <laughs> Look, <laughs> here's a 350 million year old fish swimming right. off right. of Madagascar in Indonesia. That's a ghost. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess it definitely. I don't think there is a walking ghost population Mm -hmm. somewhere around today that hybridized 40, 50,000 years ago with different populations. You know, so I don't think there are living Neanderthals or Denisovans hiding somewhere out there. Um, but populations for which you have no fossils whatsoever can exist for mil- I mean the coelacanth is a, a great example I, I forget what year it was finally caught but mm-hmm. paleontologists knew about them you know from the 1860s 70s and then all of a sudden in the 20th century they're picking them up on fishing lines. <laughs> um, so I, there are ghost lineages throughout evolutionary history have existed. Do they still exist today? I would say most of the ones that have been proposed are unlikely, mm-hmm. not impossible. Right, right. And I think as you've illustrated throughout this chat, uh, don't say things are impossible, I think. Oh, some things. so if you watch any of the stupid shows I've done, I have never <laughs> said it can't exist, it does not exist, it's possible. I have in the last few years gotten more likely to say the probability isn't zero, but it's adjacent to it. <laughs> yeah, I, I like got that, that tech too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I I don't for the life of me, I don't remember what it was, but I actually remember seeing you on some documentary probably 15 years ago. You had a pink mohawk still. Mm-hmm. Uh I think it was pink. Um and I just remember you with the pipette. And you were doing it, so some... I've never had a pink mohawk, but never pink. Okay, I have. So was it green? No, but this hair. I've been shaving my head for sixteen years, 
And for some of those, I had a Mohawk. But okay. when I had the detached retina and right. I had no depth perception, I stopped shaving my head because I would just mm. cut the hell out of myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> so I could see that. Being this is the first hair I have had in 15 years <laughs> for the last wow. like three or four months. Um, but no, I had a Mohawk for a while. Um, but I just, I just so distinctly remember you, and your name came up the other a few months ago on you know my feed or something. I was like, wow, I you know, I didn't remember you even being involved in what what it was. So but it was just so fascinating. My very first show was I can't remember if it's ninety five or ninety six. Uh -huh. I was actually on MTV. <laughs> John Stewart was oh DJing gosh. a show called Sex in the 90s. If you go to YouTube, you can find it. Look, <laughs> Go to YouTube and look up Dog Brothers. So I was on an episode, it was my very first TV. I was on an episode of Sex in the 90s as the super nerdy biological anthropologist <laughs> the the topic was sex in the night or what men want uh -huh. and it was a dual episode half of it was what men want the other half is what women want right and Makes my sense. interview is literally sandwiched between hugh hefner and snoop dogg <laughs> <laughs> and i'm just they're just showing you know chimps fucking in the background can i say that in the background it's and I'm just like, men just want to spread their genes. You know, I'm just giving the standard <laughs> Ev 101 yeah. lecture of this amongst all, all these cool, cool people. And I'm there <laughs> in this DNA tie in my laboratory, and it's it's insane. But if you YouTube Dog Brothers, you will come across me. <laughs> That's hilarious. And that now, what that yeah. led to 30 other shows. Once you're in the Rolodex in New York City for the locals, mm -hmm. that just spirals out of control. They, they you become the go-to guy to ask. Good to know. So don't do now, that. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> no, because you get asked every stupid question in the oh, world I'm by sure. everyone. What, what was the worst question you were asked? Um, Probably <laughs> so Steve Ducey okay. was on Fox and Friends for years. He is the father of the young White House correspondent who every time he asked a question, Jen Pesky just bitch slapped him down because he would ask a stupid question. <laughs> oh, I so, actually know who you're talking yeah, about. Just yeah, because but his that. father yeah. was on Fox and Friends, you know, the main morning show. They tricked me when in 1997 when the first Neanderthal DNA was sequenced. Mm hmm they tricked me into coming to the Fox studio in New York City to do an interview about Neanderthal DNA. But mm -hmm. it turned out it was Steve Ducey interviewing me about the evolution of the family. And I mean, he literally was talking about Fred and Wilma, white picket fence, two kid, 2.1 kids and a dog, a line <laughs> he used like seven times. And he kept wow. asking me about what were humans like. But he also was interviewing David Buss, the evolutionary psychologist. Not familiar. Actually. Well, let's just say we completely disagreed on everything. <laughs> <laughs> so I was literally on Fox News being interviewed about the evolution. Well, I, I thought it was going to be about Neanderthal DNA. Mm -hmm. Ryan Williams at MSNBC asked me about Neanderthal DNA. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> and then followed it up with the, the scene of throwing up the tool from 2001 Space Odyssey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. But, you know, at least he, well, he didn't get my name right, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was the worst interview I ever did was getting these literally inane Fox questions off a teleprompter. And if you ever watch it, I, I can send you a link. Um, I'd be interested. Yes. 60 seconds in his teleprompter flickered off for a minute and he just started stammering. He didn't know what to say, what to ask, what to do. It was astounding. Teleprompter came back straight into the next question <laughs> amazing amazing so you have had a long obviously so what was it 27 years you said at nyu 25 at nyu yeah so what got you you said is it simply the fact that you want to change what you're doing or did something else get you to finally oh my on? uh my wonderful wife of 35 years got a job offer as the chair of the Department of Family Medicine at University of Massachusetts. Well, congratulations. And so I wanted to stay married <laughs> and <laughs> followed her as a spousal. Mm. So I, I have, and I, I just want to be honest here to your viewers, many of whom might be academics or hopefully are. <laughs> Um, I was very reticent to leave. I had everything going, but real life intercedes. But I was particularly reticent about becoming a spousal. Like, you're being forced on this department. They're like, mm -hmm. oh, we get to vote yes or no, but you got the dean and the chancellor and the provost putting this forward. Like, can you tell us what you think, please? Mm. <laughs> and so yeah. I came in, I felt like under a cloud. They could not have been happier. <laughs> so well, first of all, the med school paid for my move and a couple years of my salary and my startup. So the department got somebody they would have never afforded ever. <laughs> yeah. And I'm told I'm not an asshole. So, you know, they like, <laughs> <laughs> but I came in under this weird spousal thing. Right. But if you or any of your listeners ever get the chance to be a spousal hire somewhere because of your partner, take it. The, yeah. the, what we call the two body problem in physics <laughs> is way worse in academia. I can imagine. Yeah. So the, the only downside of it is most super uber private universities don't do those. Because mm -hmm. a department said, would you please hire this person? So this other department can hire a person will say no way. <laughs> Right. State schools do it all the time because they can get like a superstar and a star, mm -hmm. but overall pay less. You know, the ability mm -hmm. for you to join another department at the same city as your partner, but you're paid 20% less. If you love your partner, you're going to take that. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah. Definitely. So this Definitely. is just drifting off into weird ass career <laughs> advice. <laughs> well, that, you know, brings us to the next question where I just wanted to rewind all the way back. I mean, all the way back. So what got you interested? You said you started in paleo. What got you interested in that to begin with? <laughs> Not even that. So this is the best <laughs> part of this. So I teach <laughs> intro. Last okay. semester, I had 268 students in intro. Wow. Mm -hmm. I don't this semester, but I will in the spring. I went to Cornell University as an undergrad to be a computer major. 
because back in 1981, duh. <laughs> but I realized how boring computers were. And so by the end of my first year, I was double majoring in math and computer science. I wanted okay. theory and applied. Right. And that's how I still am, theory and mm -hmm. applied. But then the fall of my junior year, I took uh, by, uh, Anthro 101. Mm-hmm. Introduction to Biological Anthropology and totally fell in love with it. And by the time I graduated, I entered into what Cornell then called, I don't know what it is now, the College Scholars Program. It was an interdisciplinary program where you put together a committee. I basically triple majored in math, computer science, wow. anthropology, but I was like a class short for each but because i was in this program you know they gave me a degree anyways and that <laughs> got me into harvard to do paleoanthro but mm -hmm. to again reconstruct evolutionary history from you know fossil stuff which not trying to be debbie downer here you're not gonna come up with an accurate history just from morphology sorry <laughs> <laughs> i think for my own personal views i think the whole science has to be extremely interdisciplinary to figure out pretty much anything um yeah. i think the people who think oh i'm just going to do this one thing and it's going to give me all the answers i don't see them going very far i'll be frank no. uh, they 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 will not and having just done a full professor review and two tenure reviews a few weeks ago and being on hiring committees and other things, more importantly, as a potential grad student, if mm -hmm. you apply to a grad program, I want to work out the kinetics of this thing Nobody's going to take you because <laughs> uh, grad school is the grand awakening. I mean, undergrad right. should be, but you yeah. got parental pressure and all that stuff. But grad school is, I can go anywhere. <laughs> right. Um, right. And do not apply to grad school micromanage the title of my thesis is going to be this and i'm going to work out how the salutrian changed to the whatever <laughs> uh yeah <laughs> yeah so i think that's that, very that's advice. my most important advice is be open to all these new and different fields and when I was at NYU for like 10 years, the dean's office had me, I basically lectured to every single freshman entering NYU who wow. came to the summer orientation. So many of the internationals couldn't do it, but you know, 85% mm -hmm. of the freshmen came for a week of orientation. And I just like, double major, triple major, change your major, no matter what your parents say, find what you like, because your major doesn't matter. If you're right. a chemistry major as an undergraduate at mm -hmm. 22 years old, you're not a chemist. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, and I myself, from the 100 plus students who did honors thesis in my lab, Lawyers, doctors, optometrists, I, you you name the field. I would say only 50% of my students went into anthropology professionally, either directly, like medical examiner's office mm -hmm. or um, grad school. Um, right. So definitely 
it's your last good time to explore. I mean, evidently pandemics have been a good time to explore with all sorts <laughs> of people changing careers as well. <laughs> but yeah, I don't want people to go through another pandemic. No, let's yeah, let's not hope for that to be the the inspiration for new <laughs> new paths in life. Yeah. Um. So, if you had any closing remarks that you wanted to leave my audience with, what would they be? Um, so I used to joke plastics, but nobody that watches your show will have ever seen The Graduate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, honestly, I don't know what you're talking about. You haven't seen The Graduate? Oh, mine did. No, no. <laughs> so that was in like 69, you know, Dustin Hoffman, you know, going to plastics. That's the future. I would okay. say the future for academics and even many people in the real world is, I would say, bioinformatics, but not necessarily. You could just be learn, uh, learn Unix, learn R, learn Python, just have some computer skills. Um, mm -hmm. And you can go to codeacademy.org and you can go to a dozen places and just learn the minimal basics of Unix or Linux and statistical packages and some simple programming languages. It doesn't matter if you're in particle physics or in paleoanthro or zooarchaeology you're going to be analyzing data mm -hmm. and you don't want to do it in Excel. <laughs> <laughs> you just, so that, that's my one thing. But the other mo more important thing is follow your passion. I mean, I started out computer science major. I loved computers. I was taking a couple computer classes in high school. I thought I want to be a programmer. My mm -hmm. summer job was actually as a programmer at an insurance company. And that instantly converted me to like, you don't want to be a programmer. <laughs> <laughs> or an insurance company <laughs> writing in COBOL. Oh, yeah. That Fun. is as old as Fortran. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. Find your passion and you'll make it work. The other non-popular thing I like to say is have kids as early as you can so you can enjoy them. Mm -hmm. Not so you're a 55-year-old duffer trying to throw a ball, <laughs> baseball, <laughs> or do something. I mean, we literally had our first child three months before we finished grad school and residency. And now I got a 30 year old son and I can still beat him at most sports. <laughs> <laughs> that so, is great oh, those are the two real pieces of advice. And I think they are great pieces of advice and a great place for us to leave off. I would like to thank you so much for coming on the show with us. This again was Professor Todd Dissatel he was great to have on thank you again it was wonderful and i will see you hello everyone thank you for watching this episode of the story of us i hope you had an amazing time and learning experience my guests and i had a great time putting this together for your enjoyment I hope that you learned something and that there's always more to learn. If you would like to watch our previous episodes, please view them on my YouTube channel or my website, which is listed in the description below. And please subscribe and like to not miss future episodes. Thank you all so much and have a great rest of your day.